come before God and ask the Lord of Jesus for the cleanses. Let the blood appear. Let the blood flow. Let the blood operate. Let the blood work. Come and pray. Apply the blood. Pray and apply the blood. Pray and apply the blood. Stala Hassan. Oh,
Pala, there is none like you, O King, there is none to be compared to you, you are King, you reign forever, Lord, we bow and we worship you, we bow and we give you all the praise for you alone, we exalt and you alone deserve to be lifted high above every other name, and other men sing of your name, Jesus, all the time, you are we bow before your throne, you know, in our say, take your place, O God. Take your place, O Lord. You are who was and is to come, O God. We magnify the God. We magnify. Oh, my 
Sometimes your flesh is pushing you to engage me. There are levels of the supernatural. There are levels where you levitate in the spirit. You move beyond what is happening to you to the next level. There are moments when you are singing a song, you feel that you are virtually flapping your wings about to fly. You're about to be caught up in the realms of the spirit. Those are the kind of moments we want to have with you tonight. And I, I sense such a moment right now is beginning to develop in your room right now. Wherever you are, whether you are driving, whether you are sitting, whether you are lying down. There are moments like that. You feel that you, you, are, you are levitating, you are being caught up. There is a certain kind of active separation from the lower realms to the higher realms. Man and the born again believer is not just a man. He or she is also a spirit. Your spirit man came alive the day you were born again. That is why Romans, the chapter number 8, verse 11 says that if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that same spirit shall quicken your mortal body. And tonight, your mortal body shall be quickened in the name of Jesus. And so I'd like you to just stay with me for the next two minutes on the song. King of Zion, Judas Lion, reign over the waters and the storms. Reign over the nations. Reign over those who are sick. Reign over those who are made morbid. Reign over what is happening in our nations. Break the power of coronavirus. Give us victory through the superior name of Jesus. Let the name of Jesus reverberate into the corridors of eternity. Let the kingdom of God and the force and the power and the love begin to begin to move into every arena, space, and cubicle over the nations. Let it begin to reverberate through every corridor of human life, every human system. May it receive the power of this hour, a moment of the spirit of power. In this atmosphere, I ask the Lord to move speedily into 
every place you find yourself and into any circumstance you find yourself. The power of life is breaking loose upon you right now. I see you are getting healed. You are getting strength. You are getting empowered. You are getting empowered in the name of Jesus. Welcome tonight to a moment of the word. It's a moment where the spirit of revelation is unpacked. It's a moment where we delve deeper into the word of God. Remember what keeps us well is not because we know. It's not because we have right contact. What keeps us well, according to 1 Peter 1, 5, is that we are kept by the power of God. That is what keeps us well. And I believe what has kept you well over the period hasn't been your smartness. I know all of us have done our best in washing our hands and following the protocols. Thank God for your obedience. But as a believer, we look beyond just sheer obedience. We also count on the mercies of God. Because there were others who were strictly applying themselves to these protocols and yet they picked the virus. And so you are not alive because you are very smart. Thank God for wisdom and thank God for your obedience. These are powerful attributes needed for your survival. But as far as grace, mercy, and all those positive forces of the kingdom, are concerned, it is all by the grace of God. And so I thank God that you are alive and you are doing well. And I know you are happy to see me again. Now, I'd like us to begin another set of series. And this time around, I'm going into the life of David. You know, I like character study. I like character study for a very simple reason. The reason is that these characters are like us. We see ourselves mirrored in the pages of their lives. Some of the experiences that we learn from these characters, you will find out that their experiences are littered with your own experiences. Why? Because they are humans, or they were humans, just as you are. So usually I like to pick a character and study that character. Uh, somebody said, the man of God because you're a psychologist. Perhaps. Psychology is studying human behavior, so I'm interested. I just want to see how these characters went through life's challenges, what you and I go through, and how they survive. Maybe some of them did not experience coronavirus as we experienced it, but they experienced their own health emergencies or some kind of emergencies in life that may be higher than ours. And there was this young man by name David who experienced one of the gravest emergencies in his nation's history. The taunting and the fear that came from Goliath. It's a very popular story. That's where I want to begin the story. I, I usually don't want to be going through where the person was born, who is his father. All of those are taken for granted that you know them. I like to just speak a scenario of how the person engaged with the challenges which presented themselves. 
to the person and how the grace of God helped the person. Not only the grace of God, but equally the wisdom of God which God gave the person. We spent about six weeks or seven weeks to break the life of Joseph. It was a very powerful study. And tonight, officially, I'm launching a study on David. David is a very powerful character. If you go into Jewish history, up till now, David is celebrated as the most popular and powerful figure in Jewish history. They still celebrate David. One of the most powerful kings in Israel. But very, very interesting character. When the Bible says that I found a man of my own heart, with my holy oil, I've anointed him in Psalm 89, from the verse number 20. You come across the same character who killed and committed adultery. Very interesting character. But it's the same character that killed Goliath. The same character who gave birth to Solomon. The same character who is in the lineage of Jesus. We have scores of lessons to learn from David. And I'd like us to begin our study tonight by looking into that popular scripture. First Samuel 17. I will never forget that scripture. I think I've read it more than 1,000 times. Because when I was a little boy, I had this uh, watchtower publication called My Book of Bible Stories. Many of you know that, that particular book. Uh, the, the back is sometimes dark brown or yellowish. And then it has all these pictures of Bible stories. And, and I loved it. Oh, goodness. I eventually would read this story over and over. And I remember when I was in class four, I was a storyteller in my class. And guess the kind of stories? These were not announced stories. My stories were biblical stories. And so break time, I managed to get my colleagues and mates to sit by because I carried this book to school. And we read a particular story, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'd like to begin the reading. Pick your Bibles with me. One of the most powerful stories. Kids can read. Elderly can read. Um, the unschooled can read. It's a popular. Perhaps if you if you ask anybody, what what is one of the most epic stories in the Bible? I, if I'm not mistaken, this this story maybe 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 one or perhaps the best. It may be among the the best that we cited. And so call your your friends, your children. And let's begin to read. First Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled a Sukkot in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes the mean between Sukkot and Azekah. Saul and the Israelis assembled and camped in the valley of Elah. And drew up the battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelis another with a valley between them. And this was a popular way of battle in the Old Testament. And some theologians believe that one of the reasons why people will be on the hill is to be able to rain curses on you down there. Because they are in, a, in an advantageous position. And they are able to hurl stones at you as well. So, these nations were drawn for a battle. One was on the other hill. And then the other, the other hill. Verse 4. Verse 4 introduces to us an unpopular figure that stood in sharp contradistinction to a name that will be named earlier. Because we are introduced to 
a man described as a champion. You and I know that when champions are named, the next thing one should be expecting should be a challenger. Challengers must have their own record. You see, if you like boxing, I like to read this story as if you are looking into the ring. Before boxers come into the ring, they are weighed. Listen. Nobody will ever pair heavy weight with bantam weight or those down there. You need to be at a certain rank to be able to fight in the ring. This is the most unequal ring ever I have seen people fight in. It's in the Bible. If you weigh Goliath, he may break the scale. And if you weigh David, he will be like you and I. So in the verse 4, listen to what the Bible says. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height, the Bible is going to describe this champion. Just as the vital statistics of particular, you know, competitors of boxers are taken before they go to the ring. We have our first uh, competitor tonight and that is Mr. Goliath, a champion of Gath. The Bible is going to describe his physique and then describe his record of all the battles he has fought in life. Number one, he was six cubits and a span and then the verse number five. Now, when he says six cubits and a, and a span, it means that he was about nine feet and nine inches, or about three meters tall. Think about it. Nine feet nine inches, or about three meters tall. Hmm? Three meters. Do you know what a meter is? Three meters tall. Then he says, he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale, armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. 5,000 shekels is about 125 pounds or about 58 kilograms. I won't tell you my weight. But you know your weight. The, the, the kind of, the bronze helmet on his head and the coat of scale armor of bronze that he was, he was wearing weighed about 58 kilograms. What was the weight? The guy who break the scale up. Just the things, I mean his dress, we are talking about his dress now. The dress and the kind of weapon he was wearing. 58 kilograms. All right, let's continue. So he's wearing a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing, let me put it in that raw conversion for you, 58 kilograms on his legs. He wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a beaver's rod. A beaver's, sorry, a weaver's rod. And its iron point weighed 600 shekels. 600 shekels is about 7 kilograms. So that is the spear. Right? The spear shaft is like a weaver's rod and its iron point. That is the, 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 the point on the spear which will penetrate you alone is about 7 kilograms. So 7 kilograms plus 58 uh huh. Do the calculation. That is giving us 61. You know the answer. And we are talking about just what he's wearing. So, Goliath's armory alone is like your weight. Extra weight is carrying. Let's continue. His shield went ahead of him. In other words, <laughs> Beyond all this weight that we just mentioned, 
there was somebody going ahead of him who was carrying a shield to block all potential darts, arsenals, javelins, spears that will be targeted at Goliath. He will raise the shield to block it. Let's continue. We are still talking about the vital statistics. Now we are going to go to the records and the personality of Goliath. Let's start from the verse number 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out? Maybe he had a very deep voice. Somebody who is about nine, uh, 3 meters, and that's a lot of height. So maybe he had a very deep voice. Let me assume, you know, uh, just that people often assume that God has a very deep voice. God doesn't have a female voice. God is always He plays the bass. Huh? My people. <laughs> so let's see what Goliath. Maybe Goliath said, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, he will become, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subject and serve us. Now look at the authoritative declarations of challenge. Goliath says, Are you not men? Choose a man. I like to have one on one. I don't want you to just give me a man. Let me deal with him. Choose a rep. The breaking of your realm is a prophetic declaration that your entire army is broken. Choose a man. Choose a man. Choose a man. I find that that particular declaration as very deep. And I can foresee the Israelis running away. For 40 days and 14 and the Bible says he kept on choose a man. Now, listen to me. If you live in a particular area where you keep hearing a particular refrain, choose a man. What do you think will happen when you sleep? You may dream with that statement. I believe the soldiers went to bed and they all can hear, choose a man. 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 Now, I like to stay here for just two minutes. Listen to the, listen to the revelation here. Do you see that in this story so far, Goliath is not concerned about men, but a man? Success, as far as Goliath is concerned, is not about numbers. It's about the viability of somebody who is available. I've used three words. I've used numbers, I've used viability, I've used availability. It's not about numbers. He said, choose a man. He was calling for somebody, number one, who is available. Number two, somebody who is viable. There are two words. I'd like to just read the descriptions again. Maybe you missed it. Let's go back again. Verse number eight. Goliath is about to speak base again. Let's go. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. <laughs> that is availability. If the man is available, because if he's available, he can come down. Choose a man. Choose a man and have him come down to me. Nine. If he is able to fight, that is viability. Viability is capacity. Viability is ability. Viability is competence. Viability is strength. Is the man viable? Don't just choose. He's telling the Jews, don't just choose. Choose well. Choose well. He's giving them 
Very interesting point. Choose well. Make no mistake. Choose well. First, look for a man. Availability. Second, look for the man who is able to fight. Viability. I will come back to that. But don't forget our principle as we begin our study. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subject. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subject and serve us. Then the verse 10 says, Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man. You see, he's repeating that. And let us fight each other. Ladies and gentlemen, getting an available person and getting a viable person is a critical need in a success equation. I'd like us to begin our first principle tonight on talking about availability and viability in this story as we will work this into the life of Joseph, sorry, of, of, of David. You know, I have preached about Joseph so much that Joseph is a part of my vocabulary. The question tonight to all of us is, are you available? To be available means that you are present at a needed time. I have often told people that success doesn't occur in a vacuum. Somebody ought to do something. Somebody ought to apply himself or herself to something. Success is not just received in space. It doesn't occur in a vacuum. There must be intentional action from somebody who is, is serious, and somebody who applies himself to the principles of success. Goliath tells Israel that your success lies in somebody who is available. Now, now listen carefully to, to what the first lesson you're going to learn from Goliath tonight. And you will find out that later on, Goliath's prescription was the only guarantee for success for the Philistines. Because finally, they got a man. They have been waiting in the valley of Elah for 40 days. And then go like, you're wasting your time. Give me a man. Come on, give me a man. Give me a man. It's interesting when you talk about availability and how availability is so powerful in the kingdom. You see, God has created the heavens and the earth and all that is within. After he has created everything, he created man. God needed someone. He said, now let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. He prepared everything and handed over everything to man. God needed man. The need to be to be available for what is important and what is required of us in life cannot be overemphasized. And there are many people when success knocks on their door, they can't be found. The military did not have somebody available. What was happening? They were all afraid. We're going to read that. Now, fear can rob people of their needed availability. When they have to act, they don't act. When they have to go out, they don't go out. When they have to sit down and write their CV, they don't write it. When they have to go and miss what they don't do it. You are not available. You are not available. Somebody gives you an appointment. Meet me here at this time. You don't turn up. You are invited to participate in a meeting or an interview. You are late. You are not available. Availability is so powerful. 
Are you available? Are you available? Listen. Competences, skills, knowledge, abilities can only be acquired. They are not just imparted. Listen to me carefully. Sometimes we feel that, oh, you know, this and you know, God give me this and the people pray, give me this. Listen carefully. What is imparted will be imparted by God. Skills, competences, abilities, they are acquired. What, 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 that, what that means is that they are acquired by the application of yourself to a set of rules and instructions. So if you can apply yourself to a set of rules, and instructions governing the use of things and how things work, then you are acquiring competences and you are acquiring skills. Now somebody say, ah, man, I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to repeat it. I heard you, you know, I heard you. Listen carefully. Availability is the application of yourself to a set of instructions, rules, regulations which help you to acquire particular skills and competences about how things work and how things operate, about how systems work. That is what we call availability. What that means is that The person who is lazy is far from the success arena. And the Jews were gathered there wasting time. They were wasting time for nothing. Goliath gave the thing. Choose a man. Choose a man. Don't waste time. Choose a man. Be available. Be available. Be available. Let me tell you, coronavirus has come to us with a challenge. It will leave us with opportunities. Be available. Be available. When you have to attend a particular meeting, don't be late. When somebody is asking you to bring a CD, be quick. Opportunities are going to come up. I'm giving you all the prophecy. Don't underrate what I'm saying. Be available. Choose a man. You will see that when David appeared, they realized that no, they need to choose a man. So, you have Maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000 soldiers. One man screams and they run away. <laughs> Strength and capacity is not just in numbers. Power is not available in just sheer numbers. Power is available in availability. Power is present in availability. Let, 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 me, let me push this a little bit. I'm, I'm going to come back to it because I'm going to, I will unpack these principles. Now listen carefully. As I teach this, I'd like you to just get your notes and be picking very powerful principles because they will help you. Listen carefully. I'd like you to just stay on the verse number 11, all of you. Verse number 11. We are going to shred this scripture, this text, this whole chapter 17. We are going to break it. Break it. I, I, I like us to sing this song. Lord, prepare. To be sanctuary, pure and holy, right and true, with hands given, I'll be a living sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be.
be sanctuary. You're and holy, tried and true. With us even, I'll be a living sanctuary. Sanctuary for you. With us given, with us given, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Look at the verse 11 carefully. Stay there. Oh my goodness, I, 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 um, I sense the spirit of power. Something is happening here. On hearing the Philistines' words, listen carefully. On hearing the champions' words, champions are champions. When they heard the words of the champions, all the Israelis, and who were these Israelis? They were soldiers. They were not ordinary citizens like you and I. All the Israelis, not some. Pay attention. Not the infantry, not the captains. All the Israelis, including their captains, were dismayed and terrified. <laughs> Numbers, all of them. One person was scary enough to cause dismay and terror in them. Now, I'd like us to switch a little bit. So far, we have found two or three things. Number one, that there is a champion. I am, I am the umpire tonight, and I'm introducing to you those who are going to be in the arena. I've told you about the champion who is coming in to the arena. I'll read about him later on and tell you more about him from King Saul. The guy is powerful. He's called Champion Goliath. Now let us go to the verse number 12. We are going to now bring in into the ring another contestant a competitor I'm expecting to see another champion and a giant I'm expecting to see the same description 3 meters tall with 58 kilograms of coat he's wearing and 7 kilograms of the tip of his spear I want to see I want to see serious description because hey boy this is a serious battle. This battle is a serious one. So I've introduced the first person to the ring. Now help me welcome our next competitor. He is called Mr. David. Mr. David, his father is Jesse. So let's add the Jesse. So David, Jesse. So let's read about him from the verse number 12. Now, David was the son of an Ephratite. Ephratite. Named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. So, he's giving us his background, where he hailed from. Just as he told us Goliath was from Gath and was a champion. Then he continues, Jesse had eight sons and in Saul's time he was very old. So David's father was very old like my father. My father lived for almost a hundred years. He died in 195 years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul 
to the wall. Now, I'd like you to pay attention to the specific descriptions of those who are who were qualified to go to the wall. The oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul, who was the king, to the wall. The firstborn was Eliab. Eliab. Mm. Eliab the second is Abinadab. <laughs> and then the third is Shammah. So Eliab, Abinadab, Shammah. I'd like you to just pay attention to the verse 14. It is the verse 14 that tells us that this particular competitors were very much unequal. Very much unequal. Whereas we read about Goliath as a champion, the first, verse 14 tells us that even if any of his brothers have been paired to Goliath, we will have assumed that, well, maybe Goliath just has height because these are adults. But we are told that out of the eight sons of Jesse, three of them were following Saul to war. And that in the verse 14, David was the youngest. So, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome a teenager into the arena. Some of you are, you are wondering, ah, this is serious. We are introducing a teenager. Those of you who are uh, human rights activists who say that this is an abuse. We are going to abuse David. He's too young. He's against children. How can you just send a teenager into the ring? Well, circumstances will ask. Circumstances will have it. David happened to be available. I'm going to get to availability and we'll learn a very powerful lesson out of that. Let's continue. Now, I'd like you to look at the verse 15 about David. The Bible says in the verse 14 that he was the youngest. But when you look at the verse 15 from the NIV, you will see that a conjunction is introduced. It is the word but. The word but is giving you a sharp contrast from the preceding text and then the text that is to follow. Although he's the youngest, he's doing something the oldest are not doing. That is what, is, that is what the verse 15 is going to tell us. He is the youngest, but he's doing something the oldest are not doing. So he says, David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to turn his father's sheep at Bethlehem. What that means is that David was not a follower of Saul. His three brothers were following Saul, but he was not. Now I want to tell you something that will blow up your mind. You see, if the brothers were following Saul, what it means is that if the king himself is entertaining fear, the brothers will become affected by the same fear. So, they are following Saul. No wonder when Goliath screamed, they all find a place to hide. And you will read and see. I'm taking my time. No, no, yes, this is just prelims. But David was not following. So I'm not surprised that David, David was, he was so courageous. He was so powerful. He was so confident because he was not a follower of Saul who feared Goliath. And you and I will read and you will see later that Saul feared Goliath. David was not. Tonight, may the Lord give me a bad David, a bad person. Somebody who is not afraid. What scares others? you become a champion over. David was not afraid. He went back and forth from Saul to turn his father's sheep at Bethlehem. In other words, he did not stay with Saul. He did not spend a lot of time with Saul. And so Saul's spirit of fear could not overcome David. It will not affect him. 
I know many of you have been hit hard by coronavirus. I've seen fear mongers. Some will see you coming this way, they will go the other way. That is deepening stigma. I'd like to end on the verse 16 for tonight. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. I'm ending on that phrase, taking the stand. I need somebody tonight to take a stand. The stand is a firm resolution. The stand is a complete decision that I am the person and I am available. It is an intentional declaration of a person's availability. God needs champions. Goliath was a nationalist. I love the guy. He took a stand for his nation. People are not taking stands for their family. And at coronavirus, they are killing their wives. They are beating up their children. They are insulting people. They are getting all kinds of, or behaving all kinds of, I mean, way, I mean behaving, behaving anyhow and, and, and exhibiting all kinds of behaviors. I like you to take a stand. Take a stand. Tonight, take a stand. I'm coming your way again tomorrow. And we will continue. Remember these things. I like to read that for you. As you take a stand tonight. Listen carefully to this. Your availability may bring the anointing. But your viability is what sustains it. Any call from God. Which doesn't lead to a walk with him is a failure. This is what King Saul missed and he missed the kingdom. Tonight, be available. Take a stand. Let me pray with you. Father, I give you praise. Help us to take a stand and we shall stand name of Jesus. I will come your way again tomorrow. This is just a teaser. Get ready to be blessed. Shalom, peace, and life to you all. Amen.